Good morning, London. Good afternoon, Hyderabad. Good evening, somewhere in the world. Um, it's my very great privilege to say that there are no announcements. Well, maybe one. Can you just please remember to hand in your feedback form? Because it's very important that you hand it in for us so we can help to improve similar events to this. Thank you very much. OK, and without further ado, I'm just going to say we've got the closing plenary. And then we're going to go straight into the, um, the valedictory, the closing ceremony. And then it's time to say goodbye. So I would just like to ask um, Michael Connolly, Assistant Director for English Partnerships for the British Council in India, to introduce our closing plenary speaker. Uh, thanks, George. Um, it's a great privilege and pleasure to introduce our final plenary speaker, Paul Gunnishaker. Paul is a, a wonderful friend of the British Council and uh, inspiration to English teachers across India for 40, 40 or more years. On a personal level, since I've come to India, Paul has been an inspiration to me and he's been constantly cooperative, has given me great advice and has been a, a wonderful colleague. So Paul has been teaching English, training teachers of English and developing instructional materials for language teaching for over 40 years. He is professor in the Department of Materials Development, Testing and Evaluation and Dean Publications at the English and Foreign Languages University in Hyderabad. He has authored, co-authored and edited over 200 ELT te textbooks, workbooks, supplementary readers and reading cards. He specializes in course design, teacher development and English for specific purposes. Paul edits the EFLU research journal Languaging and is the Indian consultant to the Oxford Advanced Learner's Dictionary, which some of you might have seen launched with a competition yesterday. So, without further ado, Paul, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairperson, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you very much for staying on for this last session. It's quite literally the home stretch now. Hopefully, we'll wind up the whole show by quarter past four. So thank you very much for your patience. A couple of quick caveats. Keeping an eye on time, I'm actually going to read out my prepared uh, text, so I crave your indulgence in the matter. Second caveat, I'm going to be referring to several research findings, let's say, and specialists from yesteryears, even documents like the National Policy of Education, for instance, 1986 suggesting that I'm now quite a dinosaur. So I'm going to ask for your forgiveness in advance. I know there are comparable new research findings, new researchers we can all quote from, but I, I thought we needed to remind ourselves about some fundamental work done in the past. A third uh, caveat is I'm going to spend most of the time talking about the curriculum and quite specifically about the B.Ed. curriculum that is going to be introduced um, later this year from July, August. So my intention certainly is to highlight this notion of curriculum because for me the curriculum as it is, I'm sure, for you, a marker of quality. When you say an institution is an excellent place to study in, then obviously 
you're thinking of a number of factors that contribute to that statement, that, that sense of quality. For instance, you might argue that the EFL University is a fine place to be simply because of the library we have, which lots of people, specialists say, is the best library in South Asia. So that's a marker of quality. Curriculum transaction can be a marker of quality. Teacher scholarship can be a marker of quality. But I thought I needed to focus basically on the teacher education curriculum and willingly related to notions of quality and professionalism towards the end of the talk. NCF, National Curriculum Framework, which we've all been quoting from the last three days, highlighted three systemic concerns of teacher education. One, in current teacher education practices, knowledge is treated as given, embedded in the curriculum, and accepted without question. Two, the language proficiency of the teacher needs to be significantly increased from its abysmally low levels, and the centrality of language in the curriculum ought to be acknowledged. And three, teacher education programs do not offer any scope for student teachers to reflect on their classroom experiences, thereby failing to empower them as agents of change. Based on this premise, the National Curriculum Framework for Teacher Education, NCAF TE of 2009, strongly advocated several things. The introduction of a reformed pre-service teacher education program, the deployment of suitable strategies for CPD, the need for research on curriculum implementation, an orientation towards program evaluation, an emphasis on professional ethics, and the mobilization of resources for teacher preparation. In essence, it argued for the infusion of quality into teacher education programs in India. Against this backdrop, on the 1st of December 2014, barely three months ago, the National Council for Teacher Education, NCTE, published the new regulations and norms and standards in the Gazette of India in respect of 15 teacher education programs, including the ubiquitous Bachelor of Education program. Prior to the publication of these regulations, at the insistence of the Supreme Court of India, the Government of India appointed a Commission on Teacher Education under the chairmanship of Justice J.S. Varma in 2011, Alison Barrett referred to this commission, to rejuvenate the system of teacher education in the country. The commission made several recommendations in 2012-2013 relating to the context and duration of the teacher education programs as well as the necessary qualifications and essential preparation of teacher educators employed in recognized teacher education institutions. The NCTE new regulations and norms and standards have emerged from the salient recommendations of the Varma Commission. As a language teacher educator, my focus in this presentation will be on exploring ways to broaden the English curriculum, particularly in the new pre-service teacher education programs that are proposed to be introduced from 2015. Let me begin by reviewing the more significant recommendations of the Varma Commission. Firstly, the Commission has urged the central government to increase its investment in the establishment of teacher education institutions and enhance the institutional capacity of teacher preparation, especially in deficit states. 
Around 90% of pre-service teacher education institutions are in the non-government sector, and most of the states of the East and the Northeast are facing an acute shortage of institutional capacity of teacher preparation vis-a-vis -vis the demand. In response to this recommendation, the Government of India consulted the states and union territories in 2013 for assessment of the demand and supply of teachers, including subject teachers, for all stages of school education and for mapping the teacher education institutions required. It allocated funds, especially to the deficit states, under centrally sponsored schemes of teacher education. Secondly, the Commission has advised the government to explore the possibility of instituting a transparent procedure for pre-entry testing of candidates for admission to pre-service teacher education programs, keeping in view variations in local, local conditions, in particular, keeping the notion of uh, aptitude in mind. For their part, the government, through an appropriate committee, has developed national level guidelines for introducing compulsory conduct of pre-entry tests based on a standardized framework. Thirdly, in a move that has far-reaching implications, the Commission has recommended that teacher education should be part of the higher education system and that the duration of teacher education programs should be enhanced in keeping with the recommendation of the Education Commission of 1966. Way back in 1966, the Commission actually suggested that B.Ed. programs ought to be two years long, and that is going to happen soon, and the internship period on the two-year program is going to be 20 weeks school internship, four weeks in the first year, and 16 weeks in the second year. Accordingly, NCTE and UGC have held consultations with state governments, universities, and other stakeholders with a view to including teacher education programs in higher education. Plans have been set in motion by statutory academic bodies of universities to introduce a four-year integrated BA, B.Ed. and B.Sc. B.Ed. after high secondary school and a two-year B.Ed. after graduation. EFL University, for instance, is gearing up to introduce a two-year B.Ed. English program as well as a two-year M.Ed. program from the 2012, sorry, 2015 academic year. Fourthly, in keeping with another important recommendation of the Education Commission of 1966, the Varma Commission has suggested that every pre-service teacher education institution should have a dedicated school attached to it, more or less as a laboratory, where student teachers get opportunities to experiment with new ideas and hone their capacities and skills to become reflective practitioners. And finally, the Commission has recommended that teacher education programs should be redesigned, keeping in view the suggestions made in NCFTE of 2009-2010. NCFTE says, and I quote, any system in order to be forward-looking must be bold in encouraging experimentation and innovation and also be involved with constant review of the outcome of such efforts. The field of teacher education should be no exception. In response to this recommendation, NCTE has formulated guidelines for SCERTs and universities to undertake a major revision of teacher education curriculums based on NCFTE 
and to upload the progress of their revision on their websites. English in India represents a wide range of use and ownership, from a foreign language through to a second language and a first language. Consequently, the context in which English is taught reflect this range and diversity and have implications for the teacher's linguistic proficiency and professional competence. In this regard, the National Focus Group on the Teaching of English position paper, which was actually prepared before NCF 2005, but actually published a year later, envisions the route teacher education should take, and I quote, teacher education needs to be ongoing and on-site, as well as preparatory. Emphasis must be laid on teacher proficiency in or familiarity with the language, as the teacher is often a role model. Proficiency and professional awareness are equally to be promoted, the latter to be imparted where necessary through the teacher's own languages. NCFTE elaborates this national vision of teacher education by foregrounding five principles that should inform the enterprise. The integrative and eclectic nature of teacher education, its liberal, humanistic, and non-didactic underpinnings, its multicultural and context-sensitive facets, the necessity for it to be transacted in a diversity of learning spaces and curriculum sites apart from the classroom, and most importantly, reflective practice to be its chief aim. Like other universities that have a Department of Education, EFLU has embarked on a process of curriculum renewal with regard to its B.Ed. English program. As you may be aware, the EFLU program is one of only two NCTE-recognized B.Ed. in English programs in the country. I'm now going to, to describe the route curriculum renewal is likely to take in the next few months in the Department of Education at my university. Our renewal will use the following two statements as working definitions of a curriculum. Firstly, the 1984 Chris Scanlon thesis that a curriculum is concerned with making general statements about language learning, learning purpose and experience, evaluation, and the role relationships of teachers and learners. Secondly, the CRISP 1988 statement by David Noonan that a curriculum is concerned with the planning, implementation, evaluation, management, and administration of education programs. We'll attempt to move away from a Tylerian model of curriculum development, which is regarded as a technical, objectives-driven, rational product approach. In summary, Ralph Tyler argued in 1949, a long time ago, that the curriculum planner must first decide what educational purposes the school should attain, and then determine what educational experiences can be provided that are most likely to attain these purposes. Thirdly, the planner must find ways for these educational experiences to be organized effectively. And lastly, determine whether the educational purposes are being attained. As Tyler himself said in his book, since the real purpose of education is not to have the instructor perform certain activities, but to bring about significant changes in the student's pattern of behavior, it becomes important to recognize that any statements of objectives of the school 
should be a statement of changes to take place in these students. We will try to adopt a non-linear approach, such as Lawrence Stenhouse's 1975 process approach to curriculum development. Stenhouse argued that good education is open-ended and experimental. An objectives or technical model like Tyler's is more appropriate to a curriculum that focuses on skills and information. A process model is more appropriate in areas of the curriculum that center on knowledge and understanding. Stenhouse said that the curriculum is not designed on a pre-specification of behavioral objectives. It is founded on the idea that knowledge must be speculative and thus indeterminate as to student outcomes if it is to be worthwhile. In the process model of assessment, the teacher is a critic, not merely a marker, the task of appraisal is to improve learners' capacity to work, and so assessment is about the teaching of self-assessment. Stenhouse suggested that the process model is committed to teacher development since it is based on principles of procedure. Since this involves teacher judgment, it is more difficult to implement in practice, but it offers a higher degree of personal and professional development. In essence, a curriculum, a curriculum plan, should be a recommendation, not a prescription. Stenhouse offered a definition of a curriculum in his landmark 1975 publication. A curriculum is an attempt to communicate the essential principles and features of an educational proposal in such a form that it is open to critical scrutiny and capable of effective translation into practice. I'll skip the next two slides. In other words, I'll, I won't talk about it. I'll just show to you the differences between Tyler and Stenhouse. The approach, take a close look at the Stenhouse approach. The process, again, take a look at the, the right column. The teacher, Please take a look at the right column again. The form in which the curriculum is put together. And finally, Stenhouse's own metaphor in which he compares the Tylerian recipe with his own recipe. Now that we have some idea of the approach that we could possibly adopt in our curriculum renewal, can we now extend our choice of a process model of curriculum development to include an appropriate value system underlying educational traditions. I'm referring now to ideology. Skilbeck, 1982, developed a framework of three major educational traditions, all based on ideology. Classical humanism, reconstructionism, and progressivism. The focus of classical humanism is the transmission of valued content to an elite section of the next generation so that their intellectual abilities can be developed. 
The content-based curriculum relies heavily on the transfer of respected cultural heritage to the learner. Classical humanism is characterized above all by the desire to promote broad intellectual capacities such as memorization and the ability to analyze, classify, and reconstruct elements of knowledge so that these capacities can be brought to bear on the various challenges likely to be encountered in life. The teacher is seen as someone who possesses knowledge and whose task is simply to pass it on to the learners. Just as knowledge is to be passed on from generation to generation, so cultural values are to be transmitted through the hidden curriculum and through the study of works of proven moral and aesthetic value whose inherent merits are then celebrated. Classical humanism cannot obviously be the basis for curriculum design because the model does not accommodate the wider purposes of education and does not take into account the abilities or problems of the individual learner or the complexities of the learning process itself. In an era of globalization and in multicultural egalitarian India, the transmission of one particular culture to a chosen elite cannot obviously be justified. In the ELT context, classical humanism lies at the heart of the grammar-based curriculum where the aim is to enable learners to master the grammar rules and vocabulary of English. The content or the syllabus emerges from a selection and gradation of discrete grammatical structures and lexical items. The starting point for the grammar-based curriculum then is the target language as a relatively fixed concept and it largely ignores factors such as context, appropriacy of use, modes of discourse, or individual learner needs. Skillbeck's second major ideological tradition is Reconstructionism. Reconstructionism is regarded as an essentially optimistic ideology which suggests that people can improve themselves and their environment. The goal of this model is to bring about desired social change, and in order to reach this goal, learners should be provided with knowledge and skills that are useful for social life. It is seen as an instrument of redressing the injustices of birth and of working towards a better society in which equity and fairness reign supreme. The takeoff of this model is no longer the content, but the objectives of the teaching learning program. It mirrors the Tylerian objectives-driven model of curriculum development. The attraction of reconstructionism lies in its clarity of goals, which facilitates the selection of learning materials and activities, its ease of evaluation, where the success of the program can be assessed to the extent that the objectives have been fulfilled, and its accountability, since it provides clear methods for needs identification, establishing learning purpose, and providing measurable products of the educational program. The biggest weakness of this model is that philosophically, it reduces learners to the level of automatons who can be trained to behave in particular ways and ignores concepts like autonomy, self-fulfillment, and personal development. In the context of language teaching, reconstructionism is at the heart of the function-based curriculum which emerged from the Council of Europe threshold level project in the 1970s and which signaled the transition from a grammar-based approach to a communicative approach to language teaching. It also resulted in an emphasis on needs analysis, ESP, and the awareness that learners can realize their communicative needs in a range of situations. Skillbeck's third major value system is 
progressivism. The basic purpose of education and progressivism is to enable the individual to progress towards self-fulfillment. The model is concerned with the development of understanding, not just the passive reception of knowledge or the acquisition of specific skills. The curriculum should therefore be flexible enough to foster the quality of growth that individual learners aspire for. Clark, in a book written in 1987, suggests that progressivism is concerned with the following. Individual growth from within, through interaction with a favorable learning environment, learning through real experience, a speculative view of knowledge and not a static view, natural learning processes and stages of development, sensitivity to the interests, rhythms, and styles of learning of individual learners, the learner as a whole thinking person, the social and psychological nature of the learner, and the development of healthy relationships with others in the classroom community, and the promotion of learner responsibility and of learning how to learn. In essence, progressivism has much in common with the Stenhouse process approach to curriculum development. In the context of language teaching, progressivism, sorry, it should be noted that in progressivism, the assumption that learning outcomes can be objectively and rationally planned for is not entertained. The aim, rather, is to create contexts of learning which will stimulate the potential for natural growth. The objectives themselves are not set out in terms of behavior, which learners are expected to master, but in non-language terms, for example, topics to be dealt with, tasks to be performed, or problems to be solved. Two significant issues still remain to be addressed in our attempt to develop a curriculum for pre-service education. Approach and ideology, we have looked at. We now need to look at what our stand on language and language teaching should be, and on assigning an important role to self-reflection on the program. To understand the issue of language and language teaching better, we could perhaps refer to the distinction that Ted Rogers made in describing a very popular English program called the Hawaii English program of the late 1970s between atomistic and holistic approaches to language skills development. At one extreme, the process of language skills development is regarded as atomistic. This is analogous to building a mosaic. In mosaic building, each tile has to be color selected, shaped, and then fitted to the existing tiles. While the finished mosaic can be appreciated as a whole, it is also describable as a set of minute, discrete elements, each finely shaped and fitted to the others. Language is seen as a set of such discrete entities, morphemes, words, per phrases, clauses, sentences, all fitted into a composite. The shaping and assembly of the elements is rational and incremental. The whole is, in fact, the sum of the individual parts. At the other extreme, the process of language development might be compared to Michelangelo's view of stone sculpting. Michelangelo claimed that finished figures were obvious to him as he gazed at uncut blocks in the quarries of Carrara. He looked at sculpting as releasing the figures from the marble for others to see by the process of discarding unwanted stone. Language can similarly be seen as a universal and idealized form 
which lies beneath the surface features of a particular realization called, say, English. Learning English then becomes a process of getting in touch with a new surface realization of an already known underlying form. Those associated with this view of language development are committed to holistic learning, language-rich environments, and learning by doing, three concepts that tie in closely with our preference for a process model of curriculum development. Let's look at the notion of the teacher as a reflective practitioner very briefly. A piece of feedback we often receive from participants on a teacher education program is that it does not necessarily help improve practice. And the reasons attributed to this mismatch include the nature of training, its objectives, the time available, resources, modes of training, and teacher or trainer trainee ratio. The biggest reason is that the program is aimed at the transmission of the known rather than the creation of the new. Perhaps a much larger aspect of teacher education is not foregrounded in training programs. They do not oblige student teachers or trainee teachers to look critically at what they do. Can we adopt a perspective that stresses the need to make teachers' own exploration of what, when, how, and why of their work the chief source of both their teaching and their empowerment? Such a reflective approach will promote the belief that crucial answers to recurring problems in teaching and learning can emerge from teachers' study of themselves as practitioners. The reflective approach is therefore a valuable addition to our proposed curriculum for pre-service education. It is important to note that curriculums are located in specific socio-cultural milieus. To be sure that our proposed curriculum is rooted in social reality, we need to draw lessons from national documents like the Constitution of India, the National Policy of Education, 1986, and NCF 2005, among others. Among many fundamental duties, the Indian Constitution lists the promotion of harmony and the spirit of brotherhood amongst all people of India, transcending religious, linguistic, regional or sectional diversities, the renunciation of practices derogatory to the dignity of women, the need to value and preserve the rich heritage of our composite culture, the development of the scientific temper, humanism, and the spirit of inquiry and reform, and the compulsion to strive towards excellence in all spheres of individual and collective activity so that the nation constantly rises to higher levels of endeavor and achievement. Building on the fundamental duties in the Constitution, the National Policy of Education identified the following 10 common core elements that should have an abiding influence on all educational enterprises in the country. From India's freedom movement to the inculcation of a scientific temper. For its part, the National Curriculum Framework proclaims the following guiding principles for curriculum development in particular, materials design, and classroom transaction. And I think these ideas are worth bearing in mind too.
Curriculum development should put learners first, recognizing and building on their knowledge and experience and responding to their needs. Learners should develop a sense of self-worth. They need to experience acceptance, irrespective of what language they speak, what religious convictions they have, and which gender, class, caste, or ethnic group they belong to. Classroom materials should engage learners affectively as well as cognitively, that is, they should provide opportunities for learner personalization. Textual content in terms of themes and topics should reflect cultural sensitivity. Learners should be encouraged to recognize the uniqueness of India's multiculturalism and linguistic pluralism. There should be a greater emphasis on an English across the curriculum approach. The horizontal or lateral links that English establishes across a range of school subjects should be strengthened by, for instance, incorporating basic mathematical concepts in the early books of an English course and presenting the salient features of environmental studies in every book of the English course. In the context of cross-curricular language education, project work should figure prominently in classroom transaction. Since it is cooperative rather than competitive, learners can work on their own in small groups or as a class to complete it, sharing resources, ideas, and expertise. What we have done so far is to highlight the elements that infuse curriculum renewal, namely the approach underlying curriculum development, the ideological underpinning of the curriculum, the view of language and language teething that has a bearing on the curriculum, the importance of reflection in the curriculum, and the overarching influence of relevant national documents. What we now need to do is to take a quick look at the notions of professional competence, professionalism, and quality with regard to teacher education. Let's use Michael Wallace's explanation of professional competence. He uses the term professional competence in two senses. In one sense, it's the indication in some formal way that an individual has met certain minimum requirements for the exercise of his or her profession. Thus, the evidence that one has the competence to teach lies in the certificate obtained at the end of a teacher education course. In this sense, professional competence is a fixed obstacle. One, once it's been successfully negotiated, there is no going back on it. Wallace calls this professional adequacy initial competence. There is another sense of professional competence in which it is a moving target or a horizon towards which professionals travel all their professional life, but which is never finally reached. Competence here is vastly different from adequacy or even proficiency. It has what Wallace calls the stronger force of expertise. Viewed from this perspective, professional certification is not a terminal point, but a point of departure. It might be pertinent to point out the differentiation that is often made between certification and licensing. Certification is understood as the process of deciding that an individual meets the minimum standards of competence in a profession. Licensing, on the other hand, is the legal process of permitting a person to practice a trade or profession once he or she has met certification standards. There's an example from New York 
that follows this sequence. Firstly, the issuance of a certificate of qualification following an examination at the end of a bachelor's degree. Secondly, the completion of a carefully supervised internship of one year to qualify for a limited permit good for four years of teaching. And finally, the completion of a master's degree to qualify for a permanent teaching license. In a paper presented at the first tech conference here in 2011, Amol Padwat, who's there in the audience, pointed to the emerging trend in India of viewing teaching as a profession analogous to medicine, law, and engineering. He compared teaching with other professions in terms of professional preparation and development and argued that continuing professional development is crucial in teaching because the pre-service education program and the induction training are often woefully inadequate. He argued that professional development is essentially a personal journey and the teachers need to work out their personal meaning, agenda, and action plan for a meaningful and sustainable professional development. In parallel, NCFTE takes the stand that teaching is a profession and teacher education is a process of professional preparation of teachers. It says that teaching is a profession, and it's on the screen. Could you take a look at it, please? The first step towards quality assurance is to move away from the belief that good teachers are naturals, requiring no specific training or education. Such a belief is detrimental to creating an image of teachers as true professionals on a par with competent doctors, lawyers, and engineers. We need to work towards identifying teacher professionalism and establishing professional standards in teacher education. We can do this by adopting one of two perspectives on quality assurance, or both. One, externally driven quality control, assessment, and accreditation. And two, internally driven quality control and evaluation. When quality assurance is external to the institution, assessment and accreditation by an agency like the National Council for Teacher Education, or NAC, is the primary means by which providers of teacher education programs can demonstrate their accountability and their compliance with established professional standards. This would include a mandatory inspection combining direct observation of different aspects of an institution's activities with verification, of the systems of academic scholarship and management. This process can be accompanied by an ongoing, internally driven system in the belief that quality assurance is not an end in itself, but a tool for personal and institutional development. It then becomes the responsibility of the administrators to develop a holistic approach to quality maintenance and accordingly put quality systems in place. On their part, the faculty should cohere and work together as a community, commit themselves to reaching acceptable standards of performance, and give priority to CPD and to the updating of their professional skills. I began my presentation by saying that we should work towards the design of an English language pre-service teacher education curriculum, and now paired to the bone, stripped of all the frills, the bald outline of the proposed curriculum might look like this. Focus on the English teacher's professional competence, 
focus on the English teacher's language proficiency, focus on the English teacher's training competence. What this outline is not intended to do is to give potential curriculum syllabus designers the feeling that the process of curriculum renewal can be easily short-circuited. Because typically, that's what several boards of studies do and will still do even in teacher education. Assemble in a conference room, put together a set of books, lay them out on the table, and then choose a book appropriate to the pedagogy of teaching, psychology of education, management of education, and so on, and say, these books will now form the curriculum for the B.Ed. program. What curriculum re renewal should remind us about is that going through the whole gamut of curriculum renewal is a worthwhile, fulfilling enterprise. Thank you very much. Um, Paul is not available for questions and answers to nine o'clock tonight. You'll be, um, he's going to go home and he's going to go to bed instead. So thank you very much to Paul. As I said, Paul has been working on this conference for five years. He's been, I, I can't remember a bad word he's ever said. He's been constantly helpful, constantly available. He's a wonderful guy. And um, uh, thank you again, Paul. It's a pleasure working with you.